And I guess maybe about six months to a year after I got there, we started to think a lot more comprehensively about violence prevention and think about a lot of the ways that like different types of violence and harm intersect and really wanting to like give kids a more, um, more holistic and like comprehensive violence prevention and mental health curriculum. So that's been a really big undertaking that we've, we've been working on for the past couple of years is, um, you know, iterating the curriculum, adding in more lessons, um, finding more like experts and advisors to help inform our work, um, and also creating lessons for grades K through 12. So um, that's kind of where we are now in this new curriculum that we have is like 90 plus lessons. It's called You Belong Here. Um, and it is again, like building skills for like healthy relationship behavior, for preventing um, violence and abuse, specifically sexual violence. Um, we have a lot of lessons also on like empathy and um, uh, identity-based bullying. Um, and then we have a lot of lessons on like mental health supports as well. Welcome to this week's episode of People Are the Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact and to shine a light on all the good happening in a world often hyper-focused on the negative. Today's episode features Allison Blair, Program Manager at Nest Foundation. Nest is an educational nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that all children have the opportunity to, to succeed. Their programming not only prevents harmful behavior, but also nurtures young people's competencies, strengths, and sense of purpose, empowering them to thrive. Allison has spent over a decade working in nonprofits in theater, menstrual policy, and education. Allison and I discuss her journey from stage actor and producer to nonprofit administrator, the power of teaching kids to recognize harmful relationships, her folk rock band, A Little Deep, and much more. Here is Allison Blair on People Are the Answer. Allison, thanks for joining me on People Are the Answer. I'm excited to learn more about your work, and um, it'd be great if uh, you, know, you could start off by just telling me what generally motivates you in life. Mm. <laughs> wow, what a, that's a I like to go hard hitter early, right you know? out of the gate there. Yeah, go 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 big or go home. Um, I would say that honestly, community really motivates me, um, both in terms of the work that I do, but also just personally. Um, I'm really dedicated to like community spaces and. Um, community care, like making sure that the people in my life uh, feel seen and, and validated and supported. Um, and I think that obviously, you know, working in a nonprofit space that that translates over into my work as well. Um, I have, you know, over a decade of experience working in um, like nonprofit administration and management. But before that, I was an actor um, and like I had a theater company. And so like being a part, like a smaller part of a, a bigger group or a bigger whole, I think is something that like motivates me and also just kind of excites me. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, as a fellow actor, it's, you know, ni nice to meet another one, uh, recovering actor. Do you uh, still dabble at all? <laughs> Uh, every now and then the pandemic sort of changed uh, things for for me and for I think for a, a lot of a lot of artists and actors as well. Um, so I haven't really I haven't really been pursuing that as much recently, but it's something that is like near and dear to my heart. And it's always something that like will come back around for me for sure. I, I love that. And it'd be great if you could also just kind of tell me about your current role. Yeah, for sure. So I am currently a programs manager at the Nest Foundation, also known as Nest. Um, and Nest is a uh, educational nonprofit that has been working in the space since about 2009. And we provide uh, violence prevention and mental wellness curriculum to K through 12 students. And so we've been working, uh, like I said, in schools and districts in um, you know, community organizations and juvenile justice centers, basically working with kids since about 2009 to provide 
these these lessons to them that are meant to prevent violence, but also meant to like bolster their mental health and their mental wellness. And, and again, create this, like I said before, community is really big for me, um, create like communities of care, um, all with this goal of the goal that like, if we feel like we belong to each other, if we feel like we're in community mm. with each other, then we're hopefully going to harm each other less. And yeah. when we do harm each other, hurt each other, we know how to, um, we know how to begin the steps toward repair. Yeah. No, that's really powerful. Kind of giving people not, you know, just ownership in these relationships that are going to make them more supportive and more caring. And, uh, that makes tremendous sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and giving the, giving people the skills that I don't think we ever really like, formally learn how to be in relationship with each other, you know, in, in like a healthy way, a lot of the time. Um, we're not necessarily always given like skills for what happens when, when we mess up or we, you know, hurt somebody that we're in relationship with. What do we do in those situations? Like what are like actual actionable steps that we can take? Yeah. I mean, as myself, as a parent to young kids, like, it's certainly something I think about, like trying to prepare them to be in various types of relationships in life. And, you know, they're not, it's not so much that you can just tell them, you know, they kind of have to see you model it. So, um, and I'm sure many of the children that you work with haven't had the opportunity to see it modeled either. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, we, we as parents, we as, you know, grow, the grown ups. We didn't all, we didn't learn this, a lot of these things. We're too, it's our first time on this planet, you know, our first time around too, trying to figure it out. Um, and I think, you know, we're all just, we're all just trying to, to do the best that we can for young people. And, and like I said, you know, this is something that I never learned growing up. You know, I was, I like nobody, I mean, I guess my, you know, my parents obviously like brought me up to be a, a kind person and a nice person and an empathetic person. But that was, again, just like you said, like just sort of modeled through their actions. Um, but it was never something that like I learned in school, um, which I think is, you know, we've, we've come a long way since then. Not that long. I don't want to date myself too much, but, um, you know, I love that kids are getting like social emotional learning. Not all kids, depends where they're going to school. Um, it depends on like local legislation in terms of, you know, what state they're in. Um, but I think that like, I, I love the trend towards like more social emotional learning that's happening in schools for young people now. Yes, agreed. Um, certainly hope it continues to, to grow from where, where we are today. Uh, and remind me, where are you and your organization based? So the organization is based in Los Angeles. Um, I personally am based in New York City in Brooklyn, um, but we work all over the country. We've worked on both coasts. We work in Texas. Um, so we, we work in schools and districts nationwide. And you, know, you mentioned a little bit growing up. Uh, where did you grow up and what was that like? Yeah, I grew up in North Carolina. Um, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is like the biggest city yeah. in North Carolina. I'm from Charleston, so South Carolina. Suburban. So, yeah. I know. Yeah, oh, I love Charleston. Oh my gosh, it's been a while since I've been to Charleston, but I used to love going to Charleston and like walking down what King Street. Yep. King Street, right? Yep. That's like the big street, and seeing all the row houses and stuff. Um, but yeah, I grew up in the South. Um, I grew up in, I was, you know, in school in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and was, you know, not, not, so our curriculum is not a sex ed curriculum, but it like really sort of plays in the like, um, it's, it's like sexual violence prevention, like how to have healthy relationships, right, which sometimes falls under that sex ed umbrella, even though we're not like a sex ed curriculum. Like I received abstinence only sex education. So like none of this stuff was talked about. Um, you know, we weren't ever given like any, it was basically like, don't, don't do it. And here, here are, um, I always think about mean girls, you know, that's oh, yeah. the movie mean girls where there's like the scene where the coach is like, you know, don't do it. You're going to die. Um, 
so like I never grew up with any sort of like comprehensive like relationship curriculum or like any sort of comprehensive sex ed or anything like that um so yeah definitely like southern school southern upbringing for sure yeah and what was life like for you in charlotte i mean it was great i had a i had a a great upbringing i was like i grew up in the suburbs and all my family is from charlotte i feel like i'm um although I don't live there anymore, obviously, but like my parents both grew up there. Now it's become a city of like people move to Charlotte, which I think is really cool. It's like a, it's a fun, cool city. And I think a lot of like young professionals are moving there. Um, but yeah, it was great. I grew up in the suburbs. I, you know, was really big into um, sports and theater and choir and band and like I just had like the very quintessential like I don't know suburban upbringing like going living in living in my little um like cul-de-sac and riding my bike to the pool like my parents would would be like okay bye and I would leave the house at like 8 a.m and I wouldn't come back until like right. dinner time right so I was you know living my best life like running around the neighborhood for sure I love that and you know, um, you've given back so much in a lot of your life, you know, having worked for over a decade in nonprofits, was there something in your childhood that sort of led you to be the type of person to give back or, you know, what was sort of your first thinking of that specifically? Mm, I mean, my, my mom is a, um, is a nurse and she was a public school nurse, uh, for my entire childhood. She's still in a, um, a school nurse supervisor in Charlotte Mecklenburg public school system. Um, so I think that like that sort of, um, that sort of like caretaking aspect was definitely always there um, from her. And I did, and she like really instilled that in me as a kid, like I did Girl Scouts, like I was involved in um, like a lot of like community volunteering positions. Um, and it was really, uh, always like impressed upon me that like, it's really important to like give your time, um, to people and like give it willingly and like open heartedly and, um, you know, to like be in community with people in that way. Um, so I, yeah, I would, I think I would definitely say my mom for sure. Yeah. That. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, parents can often inspire their kids, you know, with like we were talking about modeling behavior, you know, you're kind of modeling your, your mom's behavior in a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's let's back up a little bit and tell me about, um, you know, your nonprofit experience, you know, your career and what led you to Nest. Yeah. Um, so I started, as I said, I was an actor for a very long time and I. Um, I had a couple theater companies and I managed uh, these, these nonprofit theater companies in, in New York. And I really loved like the, the like management aspect of it too. A lot of the times it was like, um, a, a lot of the times I was acting in our productions or like acting in um, festivals that we would do, but I was also running them. Um, so it was, it was like, I got to wear all of the different hats and, um, I really liked, uh, making space for other people to succeed as well and to like really get to shine. And, um, so my, my theater company was based in New York, but it was focused on, um, immigrant awesome. artists. So majority of the company was um were young people that were on like either student visas or they were on like provisional visas that were here to like work as actors in in the US and um so I I ran that theater company for like 5 or 6 years I think um until it sort of it it dissolved and sort of people went their own ways as theater companies do for sure and from there um one of the board members uh on the theater on the theater company board was starting a um 
a nonprofit that was a law and policy nonprofit that was focused on menstrual equity. So um, she was a lawyer. Uh, she is a, still is a lawyer. And um, the company is called Period Equity, although now I believe it's called Period Law. And it's ba it was basically working to repeal um, the sales taxes on menstrual products. So in I, I'd have to look at sort of the scoreboard right now, but in a majority of states, menstrual products are taxed as luxury items. Um, and so this nonprofit was really working to uh, repeal those tax laws. And also like work, was working with a company called Lola, which, was, uh, which is a uh, menstrual health uh, company to provide um, free resources to like schools for for one and then like a lot of other public spaces like um you know airports and um uh a lot of like civic spaces like public bathrooms and things like that so i worked i worked with period equity for a couple of years and from there um i got hooked up with libby who's the executive director of nest who was a friend of laura who was the ed of period equity and um Nest was sort of at an expansion point, and uh, so she brought me on uh, to help manage the programs uh, for Nest, and that that was in 2021. So that's that's sort of how I ended up at Nest. I want to highlight, you know, what you were saying about the productions because myself, having produced a feature film from scratch and worn all the hats, including acting, like I know how much experience you got in those five or six years producing these shows because you have to do so many different things that people on the outside would never think of never think of and and you have to like act too right that was the wild thing i was always like oh this part's the easiest part like the acting part i was like this is great i've got this on lockdown i'm meanwhile i'm over here like you know putting out fires and like making sure we have our permits and our licenses that we need to have and things like that so yeah it's i mean i commend you that <laughs> the, the acting is almost a break right i mean I Looking back, it's like, I feel like my acting could have been a lot better if I had only been focused on that, but it just wasn't the nature of the situation. Sure. You were, you were, doing, you were doing all the things, and I'm sure it's great, but I can totally relate to that. I'm like, I, I remember we did, we ran this really amazing, um, a really cool festival that was like a new works festival, and, and it was, we had like, we had themes, and we like accepted submissions from playwrights, and then we we did like reading of the play and we had um, panels afterwards that were like, um, you know, one play was on like climate change and climate justice. And we had uh, an expert in climate justice come and like was on this panel afterwards. And it was incredible. It's like one of the highlights of my like creative and creative producing career for sure. Um, but I remember being like, uh, I, like, I was in one of the plays as well, really awesome play about um, Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I was like, oh, hold on, I'm gonna, I'll be at rehearsal in like 10 minutes, I have to go do this, I have to go do this. And then the next thing that we did, I was like, I can't, I gotta just be an actor for this, like I need to pass this along. And I was like, oh, what a relief, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I, I can imagine how that, you know, really gave you a lot of great experience to lean on both in uh, your work in um, menstrual policy as well, you know, now as programs manager at Nest Foundation. So, you know, tell me about the organization itself, like where it was when you arrived, where it's gone since. Yeah. So Nest was, I'll give you sort of like a backstory on Nest so you can, and then I'll you know, where I came in and where we are now. So it was, um, the organization came out of a documentary film that our executive director, Libby Spears made, uh, it's called Playground. And it, it was made in 2009. And it's about domestic child sex trafficking in America. So this was one of the first films, if not the first film that was like really talking about this issue in terms of how it was happening domestically. Um, and Libby is, you know, she's a documentarian and a filmmaker by trade. And I don't know if she ever really intended to like start a nonprofit, but 
after the film was released and, you know, she screened it on the Hill for legislators and, um, you know, screened it in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, where a majority of the narrative of the film takes place. And like people were like, when are you going to, how do we get this information to kids? Like, how do we teach kids about this? And so she was like, uh, okay, I need to start a nonprofit. So that's sort of how the organization, how Nest came about um, and started as like solely sex trafficking prevention curricula. So like teaching kids about um, safety skills how to like recognize signs of abuse, signs of trafficking, and like how to seek help, how to um, potentially intervene in situations if they saw someone that, that needed help. Um, and from there, it really evolved into more of a healthy relationships curricula. Because, uh, you know, I think that there is a misconception a lot of the time around sex trafficking that it is this sort of like stranger danger, man in a white van sort of thing. When in actuality, it, it happens um, most of the time through relationships, right? So we saw, okay, we need to give kids skills for like healthy relationships, recognizing healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviors. Again, like giving them the skills um, to seek help um, and to like tell someone um, uh, and seek resources if they're in a situation that is um, abusive or dangerous. Um, so that's sort of how, where it was when I came in in 2020. Um, and we had a, they had adapted it, it, adapted the curriculum for delivery in like a virtual setting when schools were super virtual in, during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, then people started coming back to school in 2021 and I guess maybe about six months to a year after I got there, we started to think a lot more comprehensively about violence prevention and think about a lot of the ways that like different types of violence and harm intersect and really wanting to like give kids a more, um, more holistic and like comprehensive violence prevention and mental health curriculum. So that's been a really big undertaking that we've, we've been working on for the past couple of years is, um, you know, iterating the curriculum, adding in more lessons, um, finding more like experts and advisors to help inform our work, um, and also creating lessons for grades K through 12. So um, that's kind of where we are now in this new curriculum that we have is like 90 plus lessons. It's called You Belong Here. Um, and it is again, like building skills for like healthy relationship behavior, for preventing um, violence and abuse, specifically sexual violence. Um, we have a lot of lessons also on like empathy and um, uh, identity-based bullying. Um, and then we have a lot of lessons on like mental health supports as well. Um, and I, I guess something also that is, has been evolving is um, looking at like digital safety and um, like media literacy. So like teaching kids because they're online, they live so much of their lives online these days, right? Like teaching them not only what it is to like be safe online and like don't talk to people you don't know and don't give your information out to people that you're talking to online, but also like, how do you process and like think critically about what you're seeing online, what you're hearing online, what, how, what you're experiencing online, um, like how you're interacting in digital spaces. Um, so I think that's a really sort of exciting piece that's come in and it's a very new piece um, in terms of like child development. Yeah. I mean, it's such a huge aspect of life today for kids. And we know very little about like the overall long-term ramifications of it. Um, so I think it's, it's really good at the very least to be making kids more conscious of, you know, who they are online, who they're, what they're doing online. Um, and maybe making them aware that they are likely becoming desensitized to, to many things as they see so much. Totally. Yeah, totally. And like, we try to, we really try to walk the line of, because you're, t you're absolutely right. There is so, it's such a new 
sort of field in terms of child development research. Um, uh, we don't know yet, like exactly. We know some from some studies that have been done about like what what it's doing to like the prefrontal cortex of the brain and like what it's doing in terms of like impulse control and um, uh, like attention spans. But like that sort of longitudinal studies, those really have not had enough time to like kind of bear out the data yet. Um, but I think what we try to do also is like walk the line of knowing that like social media is here to stay like the internet is here and there are really some really awesome uses of the internet and of like social media spaces there are like it's super pro-social in a way um like it helps kids that might not feel that they have maybe community in their real lives, like feel that they have yeah. a community and like people that they can talk to and people that they can belong to. Um, so we try to really go, look, it's not all bad. It's not all like gloom and doom, but we know that it's, it's not good for our brains to be staring at our phones and scrolling for hours and hours and hours on end. Right. So trying to like find that line also of being like, adults and grown-ups who don't like we don't want to be like don't do this um and and seem like super out of touch but to try to like guide them towards like healthier ways and more like being more um having more agency in terms of like how they're living online and how they're like moving online and experiencing their lives online. I mean, I, I think that's really important, powerful work. I'm glad that it's happening and I'm glad that, you know, it's going to educate you guys that are doing this on the best ways to do it and uh, how to best move forward with kind of the reality that we live in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, and I also think just, you know, um, harm reduction at this stage in life is, going to have ripple effects long term. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think that um, it's a big part of why we wanted to start reaching kids super early, like in kindergarten. And we would love to even go start, start thinking pre-K as well um, to, to like really build those skills because we're, we're a violence prevention curriculum, right? And a lot of the things that we talk about at the high school level are not things that we can talk about or that we would want to talk about or that would be developmentally appropriate to like discuss with kindergartners. But we can like start building skills for recognizing um, relationship behaviors, for like building um, emotional agility. That's a really big piece of our curriculum is like giving kids the skills when they're having these like overwhelming emotions, these, these potentially like really like big feelings um, that, that they don't, they're not, um, their brains aren't developed enough to like necessarily know exactly what to do with that without us sort of leading them towards um, ways to like express their emotions to bring in like a mind body connection so like to, to understand how their emotions are affecting them like somatically um, and then give them, give them skills for like if they're feeling an overwhelming emotion, how do they cope with it? And this is building things like it's like it's building resilience. It's building um, uh, like skills for like delayed gratification, which is really big in terms of violence prevention, um, especially as we like get get into um you know older grades and and teenagers and you know young adults that are navigating relationships and potentially sexual relationships um to really like have that early on really cemented a lot of these skills for like emotional agility and and delayed gratification and like conflict right. resolution um so yeah, for sure. Like thinking, thinking about getting to getting to kids as early as we can to, to start like planting those seeds. No, I mean, I think it's incredibly important work and, um, you know, I'm imagining like I have a four-year-old son that, 
you know, imagining the types of things that we could say to him right now that might make sense. You know, he only has developed so much logic. So, uh, but I think there, there certainly are things. Yeah, definitely. And I think, so we use this really, um, I don't know, you might, um, you might've seen it before. It's not like, it's not new. It's not like a nest proprietary thing. We use a tool called the feelings wheel, um, which is basically like at, at you know, at more um, sophisticated levels, it's like the, your basic emotions are in the middle of the wheel. So you've got like fear, sadness, happiness, um, and uh, anger, right? And then on the like concentric circles on the wheel, there are these more descriptive words. And as you go out on the wheel, the words get like more and more specific and more and more descriptive. So like, you know, at a certain level, at a four or five year old level, they might be able to say, well, I'm angry. And then we would go out on the wheel and go, okay, well, are you feeling, um, are you feeling disappointed? Are you feeling um, left out? Are you feeling, you know, we're like really trying to like tease out of them, like what, okay, you have this big, big emotion, you're angry. What, what's happening? Um, so let's get more specific about it. Where do you feel it in your body? And also like, what do you need right now? What is the need that you're, that you're experiencing that's making you feel this emotion? Um, yeah, and we use that from, from K all the way up through 12th grade and it's a really good tool for adults to have too. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you know, as someone that really believes in the work that you're doing, I'm curious, you know, are there Anytime you're doing anything with curriculum and schools, are is there pushback? You know, are there parents that are like you're making our kids paranoid or, or anything like that? Yeah, there's, there is, um, and you know, we we try to be culturally responsive to people. We try to meet people where they are. Um, we know that this type of education is really important. And we know that the way that we're delivering this education is the, the best way, in our opinion, that it can be delivered. Um, but we do definitely come across some pushback. Um, you know, we work in, we work in very different locations. So we work in like Portland public schools we work in Los Angeles Unified School District. And then we also work in, and these are like district-wide implementations that we have. And then we work in some schools in Texas and um, school districts in Texas, excuse me. And, you know, we have like in our conversations with um, both like district level administrators, with teachers and counselors and with parents, like in different places there are different appetites for, um, you know, some of the things that we discuss. And I think that we're really, we try to be really responsive. Like I said, we meet people where they are. Um, we also meet people like where they are geographically. So depending on like the legislation that's happening in a particular state or district, um, we try to like, make sure that our curriculum is delivered in a way that is like going to speak to those people best. And I, like, honestly, there's always going to be people that are going to be opposed to it. There's always going to be people that like might have a problem with some of the things that we're saying or some of the ways that we're saying it. Um, and our, the only hope is that like, we can invite those people in, invite them to the table, try to make them feel heard and and try to like respond to any fears that they might have with knowledge with like with science with information um and with like evidence um and and really that's that's all that we can do um and the way that we work is really like responsive to communities as well like we're not coming into places like do you remember when like I don't know, there would be a, like an incident at school or like dare. Yeah. Remember dare? Oh yeah. <laughs> Remember when dare yep. would come in and your teachers would be like, 
all right, your principal's like, all right, everybody into the assembly hall, everybody into the auditorium. We're yep. doing a dare uh, seminar, and we're all just like, give me a break, right? Get out of here. Um, and it was just, you know, like people coming in that we'd never seen before, that we don't know, um, trying to talk to us about what to do and what not to do. Um, it doesn't that. That just doesn't work. If you're enjoying this episode, I would greatly appreciate if you could review, like, comment, or subscribe on your favorite platforms. Your engaged support goes a long way in helping the show grow and getting our impactful guests heard. Now back to the show. Yeah, I mean, there's statistics out there that show that DARE actually increases drug use amongst youth, so. Yeah, I'm unsurprised by that. Uh, It wasn't impactful. Um, And it was really fear-mongery, too, right? Um, and so, like, we don't. We don't You're trying not to fear monger specifically, the, I'd like, say, and what the way your approach. Totally, um, totally, and you know, it's less. I, I I wonder sometimes if it's like. How do I say this? Um, we we live in a society right now where like. Fear mongering, clickbaity, headliney stuff is like, it's like flashy. It's like gets people's attention, but it's not reality a lot of the time. And it's not like a, um, it's not a like comprehensive or nuanced look at like an issue that's happening. So we really try not to be fear mongering. Also, because like we said, it doesn't work. Um, so we go into schools and we like give teachers and counselors and the school staff and the students themselves the like tools and the agency that they need to implement this curriculum, to explore it. We give students a, like leadership opportunities for like taking the curriculum and like we've had kids like we had kids in Texas lobby. Um, at the local legislature for passage of a bill to mandate wow. violence prevention curricula. Um, like we, we try to give them like all of the tools, resource them with everything that they might possibly need to like start a club, to be civically engaged, to like be active participants in, in their community, whether it has to do with like any of the things that Nest is teaching or talking about or like yeah. something else. Um, so, like really respecting and centering young people's voices too is like really important and sort of the antithesis of the dare thing, right? Yeah, no, I really like that you're teaching skills and thoughtfulness and, you know, things that are really going to aid in their, their long-term development. You're not just trying to scare them into listening. Exactly. Exactly. Cause they're going to turn it off. They're going to tune it out. They're going to be like, you're out of touch. You don't know. Um, and it's not going to hit home, you know. I'm curious in terms of, you know, the practical experience for students. So can you explain maybe in whether it's, I imagine it's different in different markets, but how these get implemented? Like what is the actual student experience? Yeah. So so it's it's generally pretty similar in different markets if it's like the same setting, right? So like the schools in schools will go in and we will... Um, We'll teach the teachers how to administer the curriculum. We offer trainings for like administration and school staff, both on the curriculum, but also on um, compassionate response to disclosures of violence. So we're like giving the school staff the tools that they need to like feel comfortable um, helping helping kids who might like come to them with issues um, or who might come to them just like wanting to talk about something that the curriculum brought up. Um, And then the teachers will implement it in their classes with their students. So, um, and that usually happens in like health class is a really great place for it, obviously, in like the middle school and high school. Um, A lot of a lot of schools have like advisory periods. Some schools that we work with have like um, personal development classes, which is really cool. and they like our lessons have been implemented there um with elementary school teachers it's really um it's actually quite easy 
to implement our lessons because they are like with those kids all day. Like those are their kids that they're teaching that they have in their classroom um, and they already have that sort of established rapport and bond with them. Um, so, so they like, they teach the lessons in, you know, whatever block of block of time, um, in terms of like in their, uh, curriculum unit schedule that they have, they'll teach it. Um, when we do, when we work with, um, when we work with like community organizations, we'll often deliver the curriculum or some type of programming in like a workshop setting. So we had a school district in Texas called Uplift Schools, which is a charter school district um, in Texas that wanted a, a workshop on dating violence that was for teachers, uh, teachers and educators and school staff, but also one for students as well. So we did like a four day workshop with them um, that was like totally customized and tailored to, to what they wanted and what they needed. Um, and then when we work with places like, um, like we're working with the juvenile justice department of juvenile justice right now, and the curriculum is being implemented in their group homes. So in the, the, the kids that are, you know, in, in the juvenile justice system have like their educational classes, their school that they're still taking. Um, and so that's sort of a different thing. And we tailor the programming and we tailor like, the training that we give to the educators and the facilitators based on like where the kids are, what they need, what their lived experiences are as well. Um, so, so yeah, it sort of depends. It's dependent on like what the setting is for sure. And I imagine that facilitator or educator buy-in is really important. You know, how, how much does that vary? Is it mostly facilitators come in you that really want to do this? Yeah, it's, it, it, I guess it varies. Yeah. Sometimes there are, you know, especially when it's coming down from like a district level, um, the district has been like, okay, you're going to teach this curriculum. And we have people that come in that are like, all right, what's this, what's this new thing that I have to teach. And then usually by the end of our trainings and our end of our time with them, we've got them. Like, they're like, wow, this is super important. They're like, I didn't even know that this was an issue. A lot of them are like, I didn't even really know that like kids were experiencing this. Um, and then on the other hand, a lot of the times like teachers and educators and counselors are like superheroes, yeah. right? And they are our like best and biggest advocates and they are the best and biggest advocates for kids. Um, you know, I can't tell you like all of the the like teachers that we've had conversations with that it's they just they care about their kids so much and they might all not always especially like if they've never had to teach a curriculum like this before sometimes they get nervous sometimes they're like I don't know how I'm going to talk about this sometimes they're like nervous to talk about this in case there's like pushback from parents or, you know, it's, it's a potentially like, um, sensitive topic to talk about. Right. Uh, but they care so much about these children and like, they want to give them the skills to like, keep, they want to keep them safe, but they want to give the kids the skills to like both keep themselves safe and like, be happier and healthier and have like healthier relationships and have healthier interactions with their peers. Um, so, so yeah, it can be, it, it's, you know, sometimes we've got people that are like, what's this that I have to teach? Where am I going to do this? They're so, they are so, um, they work so hard teachers. Um, and they, I mean, they work so hard and often like, often on their own dime, right? We know this um, from, you know, if we're reading the news about budget cuts and like what teachers sort of, you know, how they're working. Um, but, but yeah, they are like the most incredible advocates, both for our programming and, and for the kids that they're teaching for sure. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And certainly teachers are overworked and underappreciated, um, underpaid, would love to, to see us fix that in some capacity. Um, 
And I mean, you must have a pretty good view of different aspects of our education system. You work with a lot of different districts um, around the country. You know, what is sort of your take on the overall state of the education system right now in the U.S.? Oh, boy. Um, I... uh... Now, I, I don't know that I am as knowledgeable about, and like obviously every district and every area and every board of education is different, but I do think that, um, I, I do think that like public school funding being uh, cut and slashed is, uh, it's, it's very worrying um, for sure. Uh, and I think that I understand, uh, why schools have to do what they do because there is this, um, there's such a focus on, uh, attendance and academic performance test scores as this sort of like, all right, well, you have to have you have to get your attendance up to these numbers and you have to get your test scores up to these numbers in order to receive resources, in order to receive, you know, funding, in order to like be able to resource the kids that you're working with. And I think there is sometimes not as much of a, an emphasis on this like whole right. child, um, like educating and supporting the whole child. Yeah. And it's a little backwards uh, to not get the resources when you tricky. need to improve. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, tr- it's tricky. It's a tricky thing. Um, but I do think that I'll just go back to the fact that like, I think teachers work really hard. I think counselors work really hard. Um, I think this is a hard time to be a teacher right now. Um, and you know, I think that more of a focus on like, the whole child and more of like a comprehensive focus on um, how are we educating our kids to not just be like academic achievers, but to be healthy and whole and um, kind and uh, thoughtful humans, uh, I think is really important, obviously. I'm, I'm a little biased, obviously, but yeah. No, but absolutely. And I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are engaged with this system that needs so much work. You know, at least you guys are, are a good piece of it. Yeah. We try to do what we can. You know, we're all about like, we're really big on supporting educators. And what do you see as sort of the future of Nest? Are you, is your hope to continue growing? Yeah, uh, we, we definitely want to keep growing the organization. We want to... Um, our goal is for every kid in the United States to get, and beyond, um, but first let's start in the U.S., to get, if not our programming, then a pro- then programming like ours um, that, really, that really focuses on um, like really giving kids the skills to be healthier and happier. You know, uh, something else that we try to really focus on that I think is important is a lot of the times, especially in like violent, the violence prevention space, kids are taught how to not be victimized. This is how you keep yourself safe. This is how you stop yourself from being a victim. We don't always address how, how do we stop perpetrating harm? The onus is, has always been on the victim to keep themselves safe. How do we flip that around and, and say, how do we try not to cause harm? Um, and when we do cause harm, how do, we, how do we work towards repairing it? How do we work towards um, being accountable for it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the future of Nest is hopefully like more kids receiving our programming, more teachers receiving the programming, more like more resources for parents as well. I think that's something that 
is has been on our minds a lot recently is how do we engage parents and caregivers and how do we like extend the learning and extend these lessons and these skills beyond the classroom walls and beyond the schoolroom walls and like offer um, families and communities uh, or, like bring them into the conversation and bring them in um, and give them resources and give them ways to like engage their kids um, on this topic. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. And um, I think the additional resources that you guys are looking to provide are going to be really helpful in showing people why this, this work is so important. So uh, I'm definitely hopeful that it uh, continues to grow. Um, And, you know, to educators listening or people that have impact in their local education system that are interested, is there something they can do um, to start trying to move the needle and, you know, get involved? Yeah, for sure. So they can visit our website at nestfoundation.org for sure. Um, You know, they can, we have, uh, we offer free webinars and we offer like recordings of the sessions that we've had in the past. Uh, They can join our mailing list. They can see the, like the webinars that we've offered in the past. They can watch them. They're, they're usually from, um, they're led by like, experts from our educational advisory board, which are these interdisciplinary experts in things like neuroscience and child development and um, supporting students with disabilities. Um, We have a couple of really great um, advisors that work in grief and loss, which is another piece that's in our curriculum as well as like helping kids deal with feelings of grief and and, um, experiences of loss. Um, So I would say that they could like avail themselves of a lot of our free resources that we have. Um, They can reach out to us in terms of like potentially bringing our programming to their schools, maybe some workshops um, or just like, you know, meeting with us. We love to talk to we love to talk to educators. We love to talk about like the problems that they're experiencing um, and try to like be thought partners in coming up with solutions. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say like, check out our website, check out some of the offerings that we have and also like talk to kit, talk to the kids, um, talk to your kids, ask them what is important to them. What are they experiencing? Like what, what are the biggest concerns on their minds right now? What are they worried about? What are they anxious about? What, um, you know, what? What are they thinking about? Um, because mental health, the mental health, uh, youth mental health epidemic is, it's at a really like crucial point right now. Um, kids are experiencing mental health struggles uh, at statistically higher numbers than they ever have in the past. Um, and we have to, talk to them and ask them like what they're dealing with and what they're experiencing in order to to try to like move the needle on this and to get them the help and the resources that they need so yeah that that and like keep doing what you're doing keep like caring about your kids keep listening to your kids keep advocating for your kids um i know it's hard i know that like you said teachers are overworked and underpaid um just hang on, keep, keep, keep doing the the work that you're doing and also like take care of yourselves as well. Um, like take care of your own mental health and take care of, uh, of, you know, of your own heart and your own mind. Um, because burnout is real in in this work for sure and we gotta we gotta keep helping these kids um so that's what i would say to educators Uh, well i love that i'm sure some will be inspired and will be reaching out and you know i've got kind of some more zoomed out questions for you that i'm going to go into but first i wanted to ask about your folk rock band (gasps) yeah so my um my partner is a classical guitarist uh and like an incredible like folk rock guitar player And we have uh, a little duo, it's called Little Deep. Um, And we, it's called Little Deep because we spend half of our time in Woodstock, New York. Um, 
and there is little a local little swimming hole that's sort of like a secret but not really and it's called little deep um and yeah we play around the city we play up in the catskills uh and yeah it's really great he's an awesome musician and um i don't know when we we first got together we were like oh let's like let's play a little music because i was um I was really uh, big in musical theater. I did a lot of musical theater and, um, you know, thought when I first came to New York, I was like, I'm going to be a musical theater actor. Very quickly realized you don't have the chops for that. Um, and so, uh, but I love, but you know, I love to sing, I was singing with my friends. And, and so we just sort of like, we're playing around and we're like, let's play some music together. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. Uh, so yeah. It's fun. I'm excited really fun to thing. check it out. Yeah, check it out. We do like lots of your favorite like 60s and 70s folk covers, but then we do like some weird stuff. Like there are some 90s tunes that we're like, let's make this. This would be a really good folk rock cover. So we do that too. Yeah. Definitely sounds right up my alley. I love folk rock. And, um, you know, I'll briefly give a shout out to one of my favorite bands, Good Old War. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yes. Oh, yeah. So great. Awesome. So great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I definitely am excited to check out Little Deep. And then, you know, we mentioned how you'd been working in nonprofits for over a decade, you know, been working in, in a lot of areas. Was there a first time that you really saw like how much your work was a d directly affecting change or directly affecting someone's life? Hmm. Um, gosh. Uh, Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, yes. So I worked in, in college, I volunteered at, um, oh gosh, what was it called? Crisis assistance, um, which was basically like people who were having trouble paying their bills. There was like a grant, this like a pot, an amount of grant money that could be allocated to like folks that were just really struggling, like keeping their lights on, that were like struggling, keeping food in their fridge. Um, and there was like a residential, uh, uh, there was like a residential section of the crisis assistance, and there was like a food bank, and then there was this sort of um, like financial crisis assistance. And so I worked there in college for about a year. And um, uh, first of all, like I, have such like immense respect for direct service providers like that that are like really working d day in and day out with members of their communities to like try to get them the support and the resources that they need and it's a really important work and it's really hard work um and i just remember like working with clients and it was like really involved you know like getting calling the state for like all this paperwork and um, like filling out all of these forms. And um, I just remember like working with people and I was like 20 years old and, and, and a, like a little nervous and a little unsure. And I had, my boss was like incredible. And I remember going to her and being like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, this is like, this is, this feels like a little overwhelming. And she was like, you can do this. You go back in that room and you like, you're going to figure it out and I'm going to help you and we're going to figure it out. And it was this like really complicated sort of all of this paperwork um, and like trying to figure out if uh, we could make a case for like getting this person financial assistance. And like, I remember finally we did and the, the like relief on this woman's face. Um, and, and I, it wasn't like I had nothing to do with it, right? I was just like helping facilitate it. Um, but the fact that like she had to, I'm getting like a little emotional. The fact that like she had like all of these hoops that this woman had to jump through, all of the like things that she had to provide, all of these like justifications that she had to provide just in order to like keep her lights from not getting turned off. Um, and the, and like the palpable relief that she felt when, when like we were able to finally figure it all out and help her, um, 
was really impactful to me. And there are people that are in every single town and every city and every state of this country, like helping people to do that right now. So I would say like that was sort of like a one-on-one -on -one face to face um, experience that I had. But then like working with the menstrual equity nonprofit was really, um, really wonderful because I got to see legislative change, yeah. which was like, a, like way more zoomed out, right? So the, the lawyer, the, my boss had sued the state of New York and won to, to change this legislation, this like this tax legislation, ridiculous tax legislation on taxing period products as a luxury good, which yeah. Anybody who has a period or knows someone who has a period knows that it's not a luxury good. It's a necessity. Um, and uh, she, like they won that court case and the tax law in New York changed. And for the period of time that I was there, which was like about a year and a half, um, I, like three or four additional states abolished the um, the we called it the tampon tax, but it was basically like, like the period products tax. Right. Um, and we did this really cool campaign with uh, the company that we were working with, Lola, where we had a truck that was like giving away free um, period products, but also like offering these um, forms that people could fill out to basically lobby their states to refund them the sales tax that they had paid. Um, so that was really cool to like get to see this this like little, it was like a food truck and it went to like, New Orleans and we went to like Chicago and we went to DC. It was really cool to like be a part of that and like see all the people being like, yes, here's my receipt from CVS here. I'm going to fill out this form and I'm going to mail it to my state tax department. And uh, whether or not they got their refunds is not, was not really the point. Um, but, but like to see that sort of like community organization, um, actually resulting in like legislative change was super cool. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned both in, you know, in the financial assistance that you were helping with and some of this that you weren't a huge part of it, but it sounds like you were definitely a really impactful part of it. So you can certainly feel pride and in, in seeing the law get changed. And that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was really lucky. Um, I consider myself super lucky to, to have like worked with, um, I'll say it like, mostly really incredible like women that I have worked with. Like most of my bosses have, have been women or most of the people that have been sort of like spearheading and, and like leading this charge have been women. And I've just felt like really, really privileged to like learn from them and be, um, be like impacted by their knowledge and their expertise and also like their grace and their like wonderful people that they are. I mean, speaking of these amazing women that you've worked with, has there been anyone particu in particular that has been like a real mentor to you over the years? I mean, yeah, um, Laura Strassfeld, who is, was the um, head of period equity, um, is a really uh, inspirational person. She's an artist too. She's a writer and a director. Um, she used to run this really awesome um, event for Anton Chekhov's birthday. So like every year um, she would run it through, like I think she did it through Columbia University one time, and then she did it through um, uh, like City Winery down in Tribeca one time. Um, but she's a, she's a real inspiration to me in terms of um, being able to be an artist and also be an advocate and be like a literal advocate, she's a lawyer, um, and be like an activist and, and a force for change. And also just like a really kind and, and caring person um, that also values and understands um, that it's important, especially when you work in like the nonprofit sector to to like take care of yourself um, and take care of yourself like as a as a whole person and not just um, as like someone in service of one a particular mission um, and so yeah I mean yeah I would probably say her.
she's just also just a cool, awesome person um, and just a, a lovely, kind person. Her kids are the coolest. Um, so yeah, she's, she's like an inspiration to me. Awesome. Uh, well, glad that you guys crossed paths and that you had that opportunity. And, um, this is the, the point of the conversation. If you'd like, you can ask me a question. I've talked a lot on the podcast about why I started it. So, you know, preferably a different question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I want to hear about your, your new film. You were saying that you, um, that you were, like producer, director, writer, actor. Like I was, I was looking at your, um, uh, your multi hyphenate, uh, like how was that? Have you, have you ever produced before? Is this like your first foray into film production? So, so I've been in the film space for eight or nine years, mostly making kind of spec pieces, you know, short form stuff, um, as sales tools, which has opened a tremendous amount, amount of doors. I've had, a variety of those Hollywood stories where things get this close to the finish line and fall apart for various political reasons. And so this film was kind of a manifestation of just the frustration, just like, let's just make our own thing. Let's just do it. Instead of trying to, you know, once we sold eight episodes of a show and then the platform closed down and then, you know, lots of stuff like that. So I was like, all right, we're just going to make a feature film. Um, my business partner, Jeff Tyner, uh, you know, we co-created it together. You know, he did the actual writing, he directed it, I produced it. Um, I acted in it. It's called The Late Game. It's about one night at a beer league hockey game. And um, it's certainly a passion project. Um, but yeah, I mean, we more all the hats that you can think of. You know, I, I really take pride in my work as catering manager for the set. You know, people spoke highly of our food. So, <laughs> um, but just, I mean, that's, yeah, big. all day, every day. <laughs> stuff for, for a long period of time. I mean, we've been working on the project for years, but it was a 16 day shoot that was, you know, really intense, long days. Um, but it was amazing. And, um, so it, it, I learned a tremendous amount. I tend to jump into bit to different things and learn them, um, by doing them for better or worse. And, uh, that's what happened here. And, um, so most of us, you know, we had an amazing crew, but, uh, most of the, the cast was, you know, mostly friends that were doing us favors and playing versions of themselves and they pulled it off nicely. You know, we had a really warm set. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been awesome. And, uh, you know, we launched it at the end of February in the U S, um, should be in Canada by the fall. We'll be on some more platforms here in the U S by the fall. Right now we're on prime video. Um, and yeah, we're really happy with the response so far, the relatability from the hockey community, which is, you know, this is a movie about beer league ho hockey written by beer league hockey players. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a wild ride. I love that. I love that. That's the best too, is making things. Really oh my friends. gosh. It's the yeah. Best. I mean, if you have friends that you can work like well with, it, 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 it's tremendous. Totally. And even if you, you know, even when friends work together, there's sometimes a little like, <laughs> Um, you know, butting heads, but like, it's the best to make art with your friends. It's all I want to do as an artist. I wish I could spend every day making movies with my friends and I, you create positive impact from it too. I mean, like our movie, so many people were positively impacted around our set, you know, 40, 50 people. And then I think you walk away from our movie with a smile on your face and it's like, it's a light movie, you know, it doesn't, it leaves out all of the division in our society and culture. You know, it's a window into this world where people are there for one reason and it's, um, so I think it's like a refreshing watch in that way. And I think that that creates impact and yeah, I would love to just make a lot more content with my friends. I love it. I wish that for all of us. I can't wait to watch it. I love like a sports movie. That's like sort of about sports, but like not really about sports. Like Friday night lights is one of my favorite television shows of all time. Cause, and I try to turn people onto it and they're like, it's about football. I'm like, it's not about football. It's about so much more. It's just the setting. And I would say like with ours, you know, it's about a guy who's kind of down on his luck and how, you know, getting invited to play in this game kind of brings brings him back a little bit, helps him in the difficult process of making friends as an adult. Um, and like by the end of the movie, he kind of feels like he has a community. So oh, I love it. Coming back around community, like we all where we all belong. I love it. Yeah, I mean, i excited for you to check it out. The late game on Prime Video. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah, I for sure will. I can't wait to watch it. So back on to you. Um, you know, aside from family, if, if everything were to end tomorrow, you know, kind of whatever that means to you, what are you most grateful for or most proud of so far? I'm really um, proud of 
my uh, ability to like live fully in my life. Um, and I've, I've, I, it's funny, I was just talking to my partner about this. We were driving down from Woodstock. We're back in the city for a couple days. Um, and as we were driving over the Kosciuszko Bridge into Brooklyn from Queens, we were talking about like looking at the city and going, look, think about how many lives we've lived in this city, right? Like how many people that we've encountered, how many, like the different people that we've been, um, you know, over the past, like I've lived in the city for almost 20 years now. Um, and I would say that like, I'm really proud of all of those different me's, all of those like different iterations of my life, all of the things that I've like, done and done 150 percent um and sometimes they like sometimes they panned out and sometimes they didn't um but and it's it's funny this is like something that i say to my therapist a lot too is i'm like look at all the evidence of like all of the cool stuff that i've done look at all the evidence of like the the times where I like tried and failed and like kept on going. Um, so maybe that, like my ability to just like carry on, to laugh about stuff, to like not take life too, too seriously um, and to like jump into what I wanna do or what I desire or what feels good or what like um, inspires me 150%. Love it. It sounds like you are resilient and energetic with a good attitude. Yeah, I try. <laughs> uh, well, I got to appreciate that. And, you know, the big question I always make sure to ask everyone is this. If you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? Um, I think that I would snap my fingers this is really like a little high level it's not so like concrete but i would um i would remove uh judgment from people um i would remove the uh people's like penchant to very quickly judge other people um whether that be for like who they love or what they look like or what they believe in or what they don't believe in. Um, and I feel like if we were all a little bit less quick to judge other people, um, I, I feel like we would be happier. Um, we would be more peaceful. Um, and, uh, probably like a lot healthier as as human beings like both and both in a like overarching sense but also like we would be physically probably a lot healthier too yeah i, I agree with that wholeheartedly i mean to live in a world where people you know it comes up in this answer a lot is like living in a world where people are all you know we're all citizens of earth getting through this together you know no need to judge and you know, it's, we talked about social media and it's kind of a judgment machine, you know, so. It's built for that. That's what it's built for. And I get the like human impulse to, to judge. There's probably some sort of like evolutionary need for it, like back from when we were like fighting woolly mammoths or something. Um, but I, we don't need it anymore. We don't need to judge other people the way that we do anymore, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and feeding that judgment desire doesn't really help us. So I certainly would love to live in that world and hope that we can slowly move us on the path there. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I really enjoyed having you and learning about your work, about Nest, about Little Deep. i um, excited to, to dig in more. You know, I know we talked about like what educators could do specifically, but how can anyone listening that's inspired, you know, support you in your work? Um, you can support me in my work by... Uh checking out nest obviously uh, nestfoundation.org we're at nest foundation on um instagram and twitter do we call it twitter now x whatever it's called these days it's twitter um and 
Uh, so you can go there. Uh, obviously, we're a nonprofit, so we love any uh, any like donations that you want to send or um, just you know finding ways to to support our work. If you want to bring it to to your school, to your um, to the young people in your life, that'd be amazing. Um, you can support me and Little Deep by I have to check my our handle, but I'm pretty sure it's Little Deep Music on Instagram. Um, well, we'll make sure to link it. Yeah, for sure. I'll send it to you so you can link it. Um, but yeah, and just be you can support my work by like being kind and like don't maybe the next person that you feel like you want to judge them, maybe don't judge them, right? <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, really enjoy getting to know you more. Uh, excited to speak again in the future and good luck with all the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you so much. You too. I can't wait to watch. Uh, I can't wait to watch your film. The Lake Inn. <laughs> Talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks for checking out this episode of People Are the Answer. For more information, go to peoplearetheanswer.com. Please like, subscribe, rate, whatever you can do on various platforms. We really appreciate the support. And if you're interested, check out my other podcast, The Late Game Podcast. You can learn more at thelategame.com. Thanks.